I'm Clive Cookson, science editor at the Financial Times, talking down the line from London, the Thames behind me, to Professor Thomas Hartung at Johns Hopkins University in Maryland. Uh, welcome, Thomas. Hello, Clive. Uh, hello from Baltimore. You are one of tens of thousands of scientists who have switched attention from other research during this pandemic to COVID-19. In particular, you have been working with your mini brains, tiny balls of neurons to see various effects of the SARS-CoV-2 virus on brains, on the human brain and the nervous system. Tell us how far you've got with that work, Thomas. Sure. We are part of the scientific gold rush on, at Klondike, <laughs> which is taking place at the moment. <clears throat> it didn't come for us um, as, uh, let's say, distant as, uh, as, as it might sound, as we are normally looking into chemical effects on, on small brain structures. Uh, we had been working on different virus infections in this model, so it lended itself really to, to do this. Uh, you have to understand uh, the brain, our most precious organ, um, it's very difficult to study. Uh, nobody will give you a part of its, his brain. Uh, so it's necessary to find models of the human brain, especially if you're talking about virus infections, which are human-specific. Um, so we had some breakthrough developments uh, some four years ago uh, that you can actually use stem cells, which come from human skin, uh, which has been reprogrammed to form mini-brains thousands of mini brains and, and these structures allow us um, to test the effects of viruses or of chemicals um, so it came natural to say this is the human model to test whether this uh, virus can also affect the brain tell us about the size and shape of your mini brains and how similar are they to tiny human brains i would say they are compromised between complexity and um, easiness of standardization and mass production. Um, so they reflect the development of, the, let's say, the first month of, uh, of the of, of, um, first five months of, of, of brain development. They just have the size of uh, one third of a millimeter. So that's the, about the size of an eye of a housefly, so, which means you can just see them, which is, comes in very handy. You can take them, move them, um, but they also... Um, small enough um, that you can produce tons of these. And um, we have uh, the opportunity to test many, many concentrations of a substance, numbers of viruses, stop at diff very different times and, and do our analysis. What happened when you infected them with the SARS-CoV-2 virus? And, and how did you do that? I mean, we, we really hoped that uh, nothing would happen. Uh, because this would be the best for mankind. Um, because uh, um, a virus which goes into the brain, we call this neurotropism, uh, that's a nasty thing. Um, and uh, what we did is we used a virus containing um, fluid, uh, so cells which were infected, which did produce this virus, and we contacted in very small numbers the virus with our mini brains. And then we actually found them. Um, there's brain cells which clearly take up the virus and the virus multiplies a hundred, a thousand fold in these cells and they appear to lyse these cells and start to infect others. So there's an infection set. Uh, and that's very worrying um, because it means if the virus gets into the brain, it can propagate or could possibly even persist in, uh, in the brain. Is that an expected result? Do these cells have the ACE2 receptor that the virus supposedly uses most frequently to get into human cells? Yeah, this was actually part of our investigations. There was already some um, hints in the literature that ACE2 uh, could be in the brain. And it's a bit controversial. Um, but we found it. Uh, we found it not only in our brain cells, um, but we also found it in the very early cell forms. We call them neural precursor cells, um, to which for forming the brain. So there's really a big concern that also the developing brain could be infected. 
Um, we did not find the uh, classical co-receptor, um, the TNP receptor, uh, but probably it's other proteases like furin which are doing the job in the brain. What do you think the implications are for COVID-19 in people and in particular for the likely effects of the virus on the brains and nervous systems of people? I mean, first of all, it is adding uh, bad news to a pile of bad news with this virus. Yeah, um, It is getting more and more complex what it can do. And uh, what was observed, and which prompted our, 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 our research, was uh, very many of the patients developed neurological symptoms. Um, already in Wuhan in February, there was reports that about 36% of the patients showed problems. And they could now possibly explain it in part by direct infection of, the, of these type of cells. Um, other studies from Europe even suggest 50% and more have some symptoms uh, which are neurological. Um, but there's now also um, a possible awareness that this virus might be much more difficult to eradicate. Um, the brain is what we call an immunoprivileged site. So the immune system spares the brain. It does not go in, it does not kill the neurons because this would be devastating for, uh, for the patient. Uh, but this also means that we typically don't get rid of infections. Uh, so the long-term consequences, um, because brain infections fuel Alzheimer and other neurodegenerative diseases, uh, are not uh, at the moment understood. This has tremendous impacts. Yeah? I mean, if you, if you imagine, for example, all these young people who are now saying, oh, I, I take the risk, yeah? uh, I, I will survive if I get it. Yes, they will survive, but they might have a lifelong infection with this virus in their brain. Um, it could also have consequences whether you can actually dare to ask volunteers to be infected in vaccine trials. But the biggest worry is actually for me uh, that the developing brain is affected because embryos are definitely not protected by any blood-brain barrier, but can, could improve your odds uh, as an adult. Um, but we have to look what is happening with the babies born out of this pandemic. Yeah. How can you proceed with that particular line of research? I mean, we, are, we have teamed up now with neuropathologists to see uh, in uh, patient materials whether we can actually find persistent infections. Um, we are at the moment studying uh, whether the developing brain is really sensitive, whether it, the development is derailed, because it's a big problem. Um, I mean, if, if, it is a, if it is a terribly if a fatal infection, you see it instantly. But if it's more subtle, like uh, these, many of these virus infections are, uh, it could very well be that the children are born and you don't recognize anything. Um, Virus infections are one of the key uh, risk factors for uh, autism, for example. And you can only diagnose this after 18 months and, or three years in a, in a child. Um, so we really have to follow up very closely and we might have need uh, really much more protective measures for pregnant women uh, in, in, uh, in this situation. It's just a flag and alert. We have not shown that this is the case, but it opens the eyes for our uh, clinical um, colleagues uh, to look for this. And in adults, I mean, you mentioned the blood-brain barrier, which would not protect embryos um, if the mother is infected. Would the blood-brain barrier protect adults, do you think? Um, it is not clear. Um, first thing, uh, the blood-brain barrier breaks down in major inflammatory situations like the cytokine storm, which is characteristic of severe COVID-19 infections. Um, it also has been shown that the inner layer, the endothelium of the, of the uh, blood-brain barrier can directly be infected with the virus. Um, so it is already one step in, uh, but it really makes it through the second layer, which is formed by astrocytes and parasites. So the, whether it really goes in, nobody has shown to the best of my knowledge. And we cannot say so. Our, our model is devoid of a, of a blood-brain barrier. Um, so I hope we have a very good functioning blood-brain barrier and the majority of people is not, is not seeing these infections. But uh, we have to look. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the big message we have. One of your scientific interests, Thomas, is in um, reducing as far as possible the use of animals in medical research. 
how good a model do you think these mini brains will be for, um, for example, helping to develop drugs or treatments for COVID-19 and other viral infections? I mean, you asked me how, how, how good is my baby? <laughs> no, uh, but I think quite objectively, um, you need, obviously, if, when you want to study a virus infection, if you want to have interventions uh, like, like vaccines or drugs tested, you need a lot. You need to replicate um, the virus infection, how it works. You need to have the immune response. Um, you need to see uh, how these things partition in the organism and so on. Uh, if you take a mouse, um, which would be our standard to go tool, they cannot be infected with the virus. Um, okay, then now people say we can uh, build a mouse with a human AC2 receptor and then you can infect. But where do you put the receptor? Uh, into the lung only? Then you cannot study the brain. Um, into all lung cells, there's more than 40. Um, it's not the typical infection you would get in a human. Um, if it's on, so you understand, there's a, it is very problematic to, to, to create an animal model of this. And, and the animal models we have so far seem to have at least other pathologies. And I think nobody has yet shown that uh, the macaque would have a brain infection. Yeah? So especially for these human-specific pathogens, I think uh, human organoids, uh, organs on ship type of platforms are the future. And uh, I think that's also increasing consensus that... Uh, um, modern cell culture uh, is really the way forward of, of modeling the human body. Because, as you have indicated, organoid research, not just for brains, but for many other human organoids, has made tremendous process, progress over the last 10 years, hasn't it? I mean, 10 years ago, it was a sort of infant discipline, and it's extraordinary how much how much it's been possible to convert stem cells into specific functioning human organs. It, it is incredible uh, scientific progress. Um, I mean, you have to see, uh, human cells were hardly available uh, until uh, we got stem cells in. Uh, the only accessible materials are blood and skin, perhaps, yeah. The rest comes from diseased patients at, at surgeries, or you take a tumor and develop a cell line from a tumor, but a tumor is not an organ. And after um, years in culture, they, they look very different from, from a normal cell. Um, the, then we got in 1998 uh, the embryonic stem cells, but we had all of these ethical discussions for years until in 2006 uh, only, Yamanaka um, did develop the ethically less problematic uh, induced protein stem cells. And since then, this is exploding. Yeah. In 2016, Francis Collins already in Congre uh, testified in Senate, actually, for uh, that uh, these biochips will uh, possibly have overcome animal use in drug development. Yeah. So, so the NIH from the top is already uh, really pushing this technology. And lastly, Thomas, to set the scene for our discussion to come shortly at ESOF, um, what is your reflection of the way science and particularly medical research has responded to COVID-19? You mentioned all the scientists around the world flocking into the field. Do you think it's, has that worked well or has there been too big a Gold Rush, Klondike. Uh, I think it's a, it, it is an incredible success story. Yeah, I mean you have to imagine the first cases were in December. Um, it was the thirty first of December that China alerted the WHO we have a problem. It was already on the eleventh of January that the full genome of the virus was available. On the seventeenth of January, the first PCR uh, outside of China was was uh, was published, which was then used by the WHO. We have antibody tests since March. Uh, the first drug uh, which showed clinical benefit was, uh, was accepted by the FDA uh, on 1st of May. Uh, that's unheard of. Yeah? Um, but we pay a price. Yeah? Um, 42,000 scientific publications. It is very difficult to be heard. Um, it is very difficult to find uh, funding. 
uh, for the good stuff. If everybody is writing who can spell uh, a COVID-19 uh, an article or a grant application. Um, we have had difficulties for work as important as ours to show the infection of the brain to get any funding for this. Because you can either work on your experiments or you can work on writing the grant applications. And if they're not really super, super well done, uh, they're just drowning in, in, the, in the thousands of applications. And then when you have performed your first set of experiments and your second and your third, each time you'll want to write it up and have it published in a peer-reviewed journal. And I know that process of finding peer review colleagues who have the time to do it is pretty clogged up, isn't it? Uh, is, it is really a problem, yeah. Uh, because, I mean, I'm an editor for a journal. I just had an article where I wrote to 56 colleagues trying to find a, a review and have not found a single one. Um, it's, uh, people are flooded with the, uh, um, um, with the requests of, of review. Uh, we're publishing too much. Yeah? And we're publishing too much of, of low quality. Um, it's an interesting test case now. COVID-19 wants us to respond fast and get the information out uh, because here it is a, in public interest. But uh, we have a lot of difficulties to sort out the good stuff from the bad stuff. Um, and somebody has to read these 42,000 articles yeah? and, and, and tell us what are the really meaningful ones. So I'm very much interested in evidence-based approaches, systematic reviews, quality scoring. How can, uh, can this scientific literature really be um, somehow organized that it's palatable for all of us? Well, thank you, Thomas. You've thrown out some fascinating ideas and thoughts for us to discuss now in our live discussion in Trieste. Thanks very much indeed. Looking forward to it. Thank you.